art life going for you lately? What have you been making? What have you been oh. up to? Um, this rolls perfectly into our wonderful little book that we're yeah. going to be talking about here. Um, so I am currently staring at my easel that's very, very close to me, right next to me, actually. So close. And I have not touched this painting in the better part of three weeks. That's a long time, um, especially for you. I don't, I don't know what my problem is. I've taken long breaks on this painting at least twice. Um, and it's not like it's that far off of being finished. I just have not gotten myself to a point where I sit down in front of it and finish it. And I really need to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a struggle. I I think there's a lot of things at play consciously and subconsciously that are going on. So I'm, I'm giving myself a little bit of space with it, but at some point, you know, it's kind of like a parent with a kid and they're like, you're going to have to do this, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. You just need to do it. <laughs> so I may have to parent myself a little bit in this situation and, and move on. Gosh, the like yeah. hindrance of, oh, it's almost done. <laughs> it can yeah. be so like, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, there's that. I feel like you had some sort of event happening in the last month since I, or I guess in the last two months since I last chatted with you? Oh, well, the painting that got accepted to, yes. uh, by the Ohio Arts Council went from their main gallery, which is down in Columbus. Um, it went to a museum out in Western Ohio called mm. the Medici Museum. Oh, heck yeah. And so... It, it traveled out there so it's out there right now until april like mid-april that's and pretty then cool i can go pick it up so yeah it's it's wild it's wild to think about and like it, it's so funny to juxtapose like juxtapose these situations like you know you stress about putting a piece in and getting it accepted and all of this mm -hmm. and it gets accepted and it goes to the show and like in that situation, like the time that I submitted to the time that the show actually happened, there was such a disconnect. So much time had passed between those two things yeah. that it it just it felt so weird. Like it almost felt like I didn't even create the piece. It was like, oh, where did this come from? You know, <laughs> and and then now in light of where I'm at with the current painting that I'm at, I'm like, Okay, I have a piece out, you know, in Western Ohio in a museum, and I'm having trouble getting myself in front of an easel. Like, what is wrong with my brain? <laughs> How did we get but, here? <laughs> you know, but but that I think that's part of the struggle that we constantly go through. Like, it's it's all this outside information and noise that we're getting that we're trying to filter the best that we can. Mm -hmm. Um. And, you know, and still keep ourselves motivated because it can be, you know, it can be very deflating to see some of it. And you're just like, again, like when you're trying to get a piece approved for a show or whatever, you're just like, was it not good enough? Am I not good enough as an artist? If it doesn't get in, the if doubt. it gets in, it feels like, you know, you have your imposter syndrome. Like, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't be here anyway. So it's like, yeah, yeah, it's it's this completely self-deprecating process and so it's just working your way through that it's always always tough i've been noticing a pattern over the last couple of years that in the late winter like january to march i feel this the it's like the dry season in both my creativity and my sales and the mm. doubt comes in harder than any other time of year mm -hmm. yeah and also the gray. It's gray in yeah. Seattle. But that <laughs> just another layer on, right. on the cake of, oh, no, I'm a bad artist. <laughs> well, and it's interesting that you say that because I think the majority of businesses see a drop in January, February, March time. And they accept it. They plan for that. They they understand it's not their busy season. Mm -hmm. They use that to prep for the busy season, to figure out new things that they want to approach, whatever. 
but as artists, we're like freaking out, like, no, I have to have 100% sales 100% of the time. And it's like, no, I, I definitely, like, that's not how business works. <laughs> I definitely realize that I'm not going to be making sales during this time. And I, I've known this for like right. five years, but what, what gets me yeah. <laughs> is the creativity drought I feel during this time yeah. where I'm like, oh, this could be yeah. a time of making a lot of art, but instead I'm like, well, I guess I'll reorganize the studio again. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> or like I, mean, I guess I won't finish this painting on the easel that's almost done <laughs> right well and I mean you don't even have to paint even if it's just immersing yourself in stuff that you know can be good like fodder for future work mm -hmm. do it you know sometimes your brain needs a, a break you know um you know, like Rick Rubin says, you know, we're, we're constantly filtering things. We are filters and it's hard for us and not everybody is built that way. And when you are a filter, you have to be, you know, kind to yourself in the respect of, yeah, there's going to be moments, you know, it's true. And you just take care of those. You take those moments and you go, okay, how can I, how can I make this positive? And that's, that's hard. Um, but yeah, even if it's just like watching movies and stuff that, you know, all kind of spark things that you're interested about, you know, I don't know how you can watch Dune 2 and not be inspired as an artist. Like, <laughs> Denis Villeneuve is a freaking genius. If you have not seen Dune 2, do yourself a favor and go watch it. It's worth every penny of it and get it in IMAX if you can handle it. I get to see it tomorrow and I'm so excited. But yeah, with that segue... Let's start book club. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. That was flawless, Nomad. I'm very impressed. Tried some foes. <laughs> oh, I try. I try. <laughs> Welcome to Art Book Club. Today is a day where we talk about the creative act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. Today on the podcast, I have my co-host of Art Book Club, Jennifer No... Je I almost called you Jennifer Nomad. Visual Nomad. <laughs> Whose name is Jennifer. <laughs> Um, and I'm, hello, I'm hello. so glad you're here again. It's so nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me too. This book, uh, let's, oh, we got to start with my first question that I always ask during Art Book Club, mm -hmm. which is, um, did you finish the book? I did. Me too. Two out of two. Let's mm -hmm. go. <laughs> I know, right? It's amazing. This book is. Look at us showing up. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> the, I have the paper version of the book and it's, it tracks at, mm. um, 404 pages with some notebook pages at the end. Um, but the digital version is like a lot shorter. It's 246 pages. 246 <laughs> pages. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this book, <laughs> it's, I want to talk about like the writing style really quick. It's very like um, spaced out, this book, where you're going to mm -hmm. have moments of mm -hmm. poetry just i'm so good at showing people the camera here we go um <laughs> of, of just like short pages like this where it's like only a poem on a page and then a lot of the chapters have paragraphs that are single sentences right and so it's very like conversational and if you're looking at this book and you're like i don't know if i want to read it because it's enormous um just keep in mind it's a very very quick read it just yeah. it flows along and it really takes its time on things yep. uh, yeah it felt i don't know if you got this but it felt somewhat cyclical cyclical and like and what he had to say like yeah he re it, to me it sound like it felt like he was repeating a lot of the same things over and over again this is a so, this is a book that was meant. of high repetition for sure. And if you look at the cover, which is yeah. I would say very beautifully designed, right. it's very like you're like, oh yeah, this is a circle book. Um, I've heard from people who've listened to the audiobook that it has a lot of like chimes happening at the start of each chapter, um, and like lots of right. like um like sound bowl sounds and stuff like that. Very meditative, very mm -hmm. like uh, almost like yogi in that sort of way. And mm -hmm. at the beginning of each chapter, you see these circle symbols uh, right there. 
and that's when they play the sounds in the audiobook. So it's it can mm. be a very immersive experience if you want it to, to be. Um, Heck yeah. What are your general thoughts overall? Um, well, you and I had talked about this before we started up the, the stream. Um, I think one thing that we should do is pull up a picture of Rick Rubin and I will <laughs> describe to everybody the All best right. that I can who Rick Rubin is this as is... a human being, as an entrepreneur, whatever. Yeah. Say goodbye to me. Here's Rick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin is one half of the duo of Def Jam Records. Mm -hmm. That would be Russell Simmons, who is the brother of the lead singer of Run DMC, and Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin was a DJ that played out of his college dorm. And he would, you know, he would do shows all over the place. And uh, Russell Simmons had connected with him. They started a record business and they basically ran it out of Rick's dorm room. And I mean, they they signed the Beastie Boys. Rick was the DJ for the Beastie Boys when the Beastie Boys first started. Amazing. Um, he looks like he just came out of the forest and he was lost and he's <laughs> trying to find his way home. Um, it's true. Don't be fooled. He is an extremely wealthy man. He has created some of the greatest albums out there. He is recorded with Michael Jackson. He's recorded with Jay-Z, with Pharrell, with Andre 3000. He is recorded with anybody and everybody. He works on music scores. He does a lot of stuff. He's very, very entrenched in music. Um, but you would not think of him as a hip hop mogul. He is. He created hip hop. He is one of the two fathers of hip hop. That's, if that's amazing. believable, which is amazing to me. And so, uh, but he has always been this very, for lack of a better phrase, very hippy dippy type of person. He looks like one half of Ben and Jerry's. Like when you think of it, you know, <laughs> you're like, oh, this was, this must be Ben or Jerry. You know, it's gotta be, you know? Um, and so when, when I came into the book, when, when Stephanie sent me the book, I was like, Rick, oh, Rick Rubin. And I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. This is going to be super hippy dippy. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like going into it, that's kind of the approach that I had to it. Mm -hmm. um, some, of, some of these books are triggering to me. I am an atheist. And so when I have to read pieces like this, some of it is hard for me because I see some of the same things that pushed me to leave religion. I see them surface in and all sorts of ways and all sorts of people and all sorts of beliefs, um, which is a whole other conversation to be had. But mm -hmm. um, so some of it is like, for me, there's a lot of static and noise when I read stuff like this that I have to kind of fight through Yeah, to, to get the better pieces of it. Like these people mean well, like they're not out to hurt me. They don't know me. They have no intention. You know, it's just, you know, they wrote a book from who they were. And so, um, yeah, like that was the biggest thing when I first got into it. I was like, oh, man, this is really going to be hippie to me once I started reading like the first paragraph or so. It's extremely so, hippie. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. It is. Um, yeah. He's he's pretty steeped in Buddhist belief, I believe. Mm -hmm. I remember right. It's very Buddhist. Um, which yeah, which is not surprising to me because you see some of the the Buddhist phrases come up in some of his chapters and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's it, it was a good book. Um, I thought that it had a lot of good points and a lot of things that that kind of hit me. Like, oh, yeah, that that might be something I need to look at. Mm -hmm. Like, there were a few of those moments in there. Um and it and it kind of gave me a perspective shift in some respects of like how am I viewing 
being a creative in my creative process. Where am I, where, like, how do I see it? Yeah. And what might be a healthier way to look at it? That's pretty um, great. Yeah. Like, so that's kind of the gist of where I came from it. I really struggled with this book. I, um, after, so I found this book. It was something I'd been seeing everywhere. I saw it at, like, online. I saw it on TikToks. I've been seeing it through my friends. Like, one of my old mentors called me up and was like, have you read this book? And I was like, mm. oh, I've heard of it. Mm. You know, that's cool. And then I saw it at the airport a month ago, and I was like, whoa, this book is, like, <laughs> literally everywhere. It's sold at airports? Wow. Like, that's that's a big deal. They have, I mean, yeah. Rick has the funds yeah. to have amazing marketing, so there's that. And so yeah. I was really really excited about this book and I was like I went in and I just uh so first like personal background here I've just finished launching a whole series of work on my website and I finally have like no commissions to do I'm like at a place where I can like take a proper break with my work and that's like mm. very rare for me I get these like maybe once maybe twice a year and so I was like I am ready for new inspiration I'm ready for uh, a moment where I could feel like you know like get new ideas. And I started reading this book and I was like, oh no, I don't like this. <laughs> and yeah. I just felt that over and over and over again. And I was just like, whoa, what is it about my current state of mind that I am reading this? And I'm just feeling not only that I don't like this, but now I feel demotivated to make art having had read this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which feels so much more extreme than these like raving reviews I've been seeing. And I'm like, maybe it's just like not the right time for me to read this book, but I continue to read it because we got mm. book club. And <laughs> I just, there was some moments here where like, do you remember that point? It's like pretty early on where he's talking about how he had like a problem with his appendix and he like went to the doctor oh, yeah, yeah. and the doctor was like, you need to have mm -hmm. your appendix taken out. And then he was like, but you got to listen to your intuition and science for the universe. So I walked by a bookstore and I opened up the book and it said, if a doctor tells you to remove a part of your body or that a part of your body isn't like worthwhile, you should not listen to them. So I didn't have my appendix taken out. And I'm like, what? <laughs> right. <laughs> So now, <laughs> the person he did take the advice from is Dr. Andrew Weil, who is a MD. He is not, you know, he's not somebody that's not educated. Right. Um, but yeah, like I thought it gave off a poison and that's why they had to remove it from your body, you know? Right. Um, so there's that. So I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> it just, so I have like people in my life who are like really extreme this way into like, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to call it like almost a toxic kind of woo <laughs> that happens where it's just yeah. like crystals are yeah. healing, but like to a major, major sure. point. And I'm like, so like right. immediately after having read that, I was like, oh, this person isn't trustworthy in my brain. Like that's the yeah. certain point I was getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, <clears throat> oh, okay. So now I'm taking all of your creative advice here and I'm like, I don't know about this. I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I can start listening to you and I think this book is a really interesting book to read after having read The Artist's Way which also has like a strong religious impact to it specifically right. Christianity this is much more Buddhist and it's like talking about the source and it's talking about how creativity comes from a source and like ideas come to you when it's mm -hmm. the create when it's the ideas time and I think if I had heard these things outside of all of these other descriptions he was giving, I would have been like, oh, yeah, that's a really interesting idea. And I really like this idea. And it's mm. like, it's calling to me. And I just like, it, it just, it just startled me. So I didn't like the first half of this book, because that's where the most mm. of the, the major I would say the majority right. of the religious undertones lie. And then I got to the second sure. half and I was like, Okay, now I'm picking up what he's putting down. Okay, now I'm now I'm taking some right. of these ideas that he's talking about. They also get more practical as the book goes on. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, now I'm starting to like these things. And now I'm actually being like, oh, I can consider this and think about it in the shower. And, you know, maybe just pull out my sketchbook and write about this. But, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think I'm the audience for this book. And 
I think for something that is so popular, that's really, it's going to be really good to know. Like if you are someone who is very much into Buddhism, you're going to like this book a lot. Mm. Like my mentor who I mentioned called me up about it was like, she's, she's very much Buddhist. And I'm like, no wonder you love this. Now having read it, I'm like, oh, I get why you you loved this book so much, but I'm just like, (laughs) okay, okay. Wow. (laughs) And like, I... I kind of came at it a similar way as you, you know, reading that part about his appendix because the religious background I have is very charismatic and they're very, very much like that. Like very, for lack of a better phrase, holistic medicine type people yes. and miracles and pray for it and blah, blah, blah. And when I saw that, I was like, oh no, I'm going to have to deal with this, aren't I? Again. So... <laughs> yeah so you know but i you know i try to give him the the benefit of the doubt you know ultimately i understand that i am three percent of the world's population when it comes to beliefs (laughs) um so i am yeah gonna just have to suck it up and get over it you know to some extent Mm -hmm. um it's but yeah it's interesting so having said that i didn't like this book i i still think there are some gems that come out of this book and that you know if i were to read this book more like a fortune cookie like flip to a random page and start reading i'm more likely to find something that Mm -hmm. would actually inspire me and it's Mm -hmm. i think i think that's good i mean (laughs) having said that i just flipped to a page where i'm just like yikes never mind um (laughs) If, when I flip to a page in the right. back half of the book, I'm going to find something that inspires me. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Let's, I think we should go through and um, like pick out some of these topics and, and chat about them. Yeah, absolutely. So one that I have pulled out is uh, Craftsman vs. Artists. Oh, Yeah. And it was on page 98 um, for the ebook. I don't know where it's at I'll find it. in the, the paper book, but um, it says, if you know what you want to do and you do it, that's the work of a craftsman. If you begin with a question and use it to guide an, an adventure of discovery, that's the work of an artist. Mm-hmm. The surprises along the way can expand your work and even the art form itself. So I don't know about you, but there was something inside of me that was like, hold on a second. Like, (laughs) because I'm calculated in what I do, you're telling me that I'm not an artist. Mm. Like, you got to be careful with that, too. Like, (laughs) for somebody that is very middle of the road, everything goes he draws a very strict delineation in this statement. It's true. And like, I get what he's trying to get at. Like, because he is, you know, you got to let the universe speak to you. It's trying to use you as a tool. So don't come to it with an expectation. Cause that just, you know, limits what, what can be done through you. But it's like, there's a structure in which you can bring yourself to that moment. And you can operate inside that structure, which he talks about in this book as well, of having some structure because inside that structure, you have all kinds of freedom. And so like to create that is a good thing. So it's like, I I don't know. It kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's easy. Um, Yeah. So, but, but I get what he's saying. I get what he's trying to get at. And for somebody that is very much a head person i get what he's trying to do same because you can get stuck in your head Mm -hmm. you know and he's like no it's not it's not as hard as you're making it you're making it way harder than it needs to be and so i i think that's the positive to take out of it is i felt very pushed to just approach something like when i'm coming up with ideas or whatever don't come to it with any expectation. Don't come to it with a topic. Don't whatever. Just kind of let outside sources like spur a conversation in yourself of, you know, 
oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll go down that rabbit hole, you know? Um, like he basically says, you know, when you find yourself going down a rabbit hole, that's when you need to stop and go, oh, this is something that I need to talk about. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's, it's kind of on a subconscious level. Things are, you know, absorbed into you. So some of the, yeah, that was, that was kind of the first one. It's a good one. I think, um, mm-hmm. yeah. When you, when you come to this book, having, coming to it, knowing where you are in your artistic path and like what's currently going around with you, not wrong with you, <laughs> around you, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. <laughs> slurring our words here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If you if you're coming to this book with a problem and you're like, okay, I'm like one of our chatters is saying like I am often an overthinker or like this person whose advice you're getting um is like, okay, I'm I'm getting like obsessive over one thing and should I follow it? Is that a good idea or not? Or am I just like in my head like trying to make it real or and like can't come up with any creativity? Like Knowing where you are as you're coming to each chapter of this book, I think will give you better advice. And I, and I, I do like the idea of, you know, following the rabbit hole. Like if you're if you're getting something and it's sparking and it's obsessive and it's interesting and you can't stop thinking about it, that is worth pursuing. Mm-hmm. And it's it's it can be yeah. it can be fun and that can lead you towards your creativity. It's it's interesting. I my my next chapter I want to talk about it's called openness. Um, this is page two hundred eighty three okay. on the paperback <laughs> version, mm-hmm. and basically, <laughs> this one I think is really good for where I am right now, where I have no obligations right now. I have like one painting behind me that I need to work mm. on, um, it's, which is a collaboration, which I have the ideas ready for and I'm excited about. But this one is like, you know, your your minds they seek rules and limits to help you create you you try to navigate an <laughs> this large uncertain world that we're in and you you bring yourself different boundaries around your creativity to help you and when you're stuck with your art and you don't know what to do next it's really a really good way of reopening your creativity is pushing against those rules that you've created for yourself um i'm mm-hmm. going to lay an obvious one on you all I am an abstract oil painter who does a lot of geometry. One of my rules that I like to stick with is having a grid. And I've been working with the grid for like four years and it's great. I have really explored it. I've made a whole series based on it. And if I'm feeling stuck, I know that that's one of the first things that has to go. That rule that, okay, I'm going to make something on this this very tangible thing of a grid. Or I'm going to use a very limited palette. Or I'm going to use only this size. Or I'm only going to show this art to my Instagram and not to people around me, or I'm not going to show it to anyone. (laughs) Like finding your rules that make you feel safe, your rules that have in the past given you creativity and breaking them is a great way to spark a new creativity. And this is something I've actually liked from this book where I'm just like, yeah, when you have your artistic problems, it's probably because it's conflicting with what your, your current rules are and something has to change. And I'm like, that's a good one, Rick. Sure. I like that, Rick. That's nice. Sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and uh, I think, you know, I got a lot from that as well. Just like stepping back and looking at it and going, okay, what have I implemented in my life that has made it very, made a very strict scaffold to the things that I do? Yeah. Um. Some of them are external. Some of them are experiences that I've had that I've come up with rules for afterward. Some of them are survival mechanisms, you know, and it's how do you quiet that noise to go, okay, put all of that aside and let's see what happens. Like, I'm going to finger paint instead of using a brush, you know, Yeah. where I've always used a palette knife or I've always used a brush or, you know, I have a specific method that I, you know, prep everything and, um, and just coming at it from, okay, I'm just going to remove all of that safety net really, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, of those things. So yeah, it's, it's a good one, especially, you know, when you get years down the line and, and practice and you've created these methods and these um, 
mechanisms to help you, for lack of a better phrase, churn out art so that you can, you know, be a professional artist. Um, and you have to step back from that and go, okay. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he talks like when he talks about stripping everything down to its core, um, to find out really what you need, uh, is, is invaluable. Like what, what can I take away and only this needs to remain and it still gets across the point. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I think you just have to do that with everything really, you know, in your life. It's another good one. Is, yeah. You know, pare it down, make it make it simple. Like it doesn't have to be as complex. Can you simplify things? I it made me that that I don't remember what that chapter was um or like where that was in the book, but that made me think of um there's this statue at the Met Museum in New York City um mm -hmm. called Nike. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. you can imagine it. She's got this amazing dress and this amazing set of wings and she's on this staircase and it leads up to her and she's like very powerful and she's missing, um, her head and also her arms and <laughs> she's, <laughs> she is no less perfect and no less like a masterpiece. Yeah. Would it have been better if she had her appendages back? Yeah, definitely. But when I look <laughs> at her, I still think that's a complete piece. And that is a very right. dramatic way of simplifying something. But it's like, if you have something you're struggling with and you can simplify to the point where you're taking off huge portions of the piece and it can still be strong, like, right. then you're doing something magic. Yeah. 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 And it's fun. Huh. Um, yeah. Do you have a, do you have another section that you really liked? Mm, I have some quotes. Ooh, tell me one. Uh, one is failure is the information you need to get where you're going. Ooh, <laughs> I and love I failure. Was like, that's good. That's really like, good. That's great. Like mm -hmm. it, I think it kind of flies in the face of American society right now and the whole perfectionism trend that has taken off here. Um, and I think he approached it with another quote. I think he approached it in a really interesting way to to reframe what's happening in that he says when working through a puzzle there are no mistakes each unsuccessful solution gets you closer to the, the one that works why don't we approach everything like we do puzzles like we give ourselves the freedom to mess up on a puzzle like if we don't immediately put it in the right spot like we're just like okay we put it back down and pick up another piece like why are why are not the things like learning how to paint and be a professional artist and like being involved in the art world why aren't they like viewed like a puzzle like okay so i made a misstep like that's not the end of everything i you know i find flaw in that analogy though I, I think of when I do a puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle, <laughs> and I'm, mm -hmm. I've got it up on my kitchen table and I've got all the pieces out and I'm playing with it. I don't ever feel like I'm going to be judged when I'm doing the puzzle. And I don't feel mm -hmm. like I need right. the puzzle to make me money. And you and I are professional right, artists. Right. So this is where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so when I, when I go to think, if I go to think of my art as in like, oh, we're just playing to play and not to do any other uh, thing that's where it gets tricky and that's where the hang-ups start to show up and it's like okay how, how do mm -hmm. i stay in the play while also making yeah um work right, that right, right. can feed me <laughs> yeah where's the balance <laughs> in for the housing yeah. yeah and he talks about that you know mm -hmm. and i mean he he ultimately says you you can't have that like if you're doing this to make yourself like sustainable very few people are able to do this to mm -hmm. make themselves sustainable mm -hmm. um and you know he says you know if you got to get another side job do that maybe it's in the same vein of art you know it could be your curator or whatever but and he you know and he even juxtaposes it in the fact that he's like maybe it's a good thing because it kind of takes you out of that space 
gives you a different input, a different insight, a different perspective Mm -hmm. on the things around you. And you may see something that you wouldn't have before and you interact with people and they, they, they say things to you that you may not have heard just hanging out by yourself in the studio, you know? Um, So there's, there's a good and bad to it. And I get what you're saying. Like, you don't want to hear somebody go, well, that's probably not the best idea, you know? And you're like, okay, (laughs) I know you look like my grandfather that stayed out in the woods for far too long, but you're a brilliant businessman. You know what you're doing. You're also creative Look at that face. Yeah, okay. Maybe you're wise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's him and Andre 3000. It's epic. Yeah. That's like the most epic picture ever. They're like meant for each other. They were born for it's each so other. So good. He is a happy guy. I, I want them <laughs> I want them to take an updated picture. I don't know if you've seen Andre 3000 recently. I've seen His him in films sometimes, but he's always wearing costumes. So <laughs> he was he disappeared for years. Nobody knew where he was at. And one day somebody went to a coffee shop and in China, of all places, they turned around. They heard somebody playing a flute. They turned around and his Andre 3000. He's in China playing a flute. Just chilling. As you do. <laughs> and so, like, the internet went bonkers because they wondered where he was at. Just, and then he's slowly started to come back. He's just vibing. Uh, he's done some interviews recently. Um, Killer Mike had him do a, a a feature on one of his songs. That's the first time anybody has heard him rap. Wow! In over ten years. Wow. Um, Mike has been friends with him for decades. Like he was part of the basement, like the Dungeon Club, which is basically Goody Mob, all those guys, CeeLo Green. Um in atlanta so they all know each other they're all basically family and he was able to get andre to to do a song with him and then andre said i'm going to drop an album soon and everybody was like oh he's gonna rap and he's like it's all flute he's like if you're looking for a rap it's not gonna happen and like the first song on the album is i'm sorry this isn't a rap i love um because he feels bad like he honestly feels bad he goes i wish i could still do that but i don't feel like i'm relevant enough now to be able to do that wow he is he's just a brilliant musician and but he's so comfortable in himself when you hear him talk but he looks like rick rubin now he's got like gray hair and it's wild and or he's wearing this big rasta hat and like he is just and he's wearing overalls with like these Harry Potter glasses. It's it's amazing. It's just wonderful. And they need to take a new picture. Listen, Long story short, you're gonna have to look that up they because need to, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. They they need to uh, they need to get together and take another picture because mm-hmm. yeah, the world needs that. <laughs> we, we need it. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I don't like your book, but we need it. <laughs> yeah, we need it, Rick. We need it. <laughs> if you're listening. If you're listening. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> gosh oh okay i i've got another one that i that i liked i've got two more two more like sections that i liked and they all happen okay. to be like right after each other which is saying something i think um so on page 295 we have the section called 24 7 it's called stand in it and i okay. talked about this in the last episode of art book club about how creativity is something that you do constantly without trying creativity is like a way of living um or oh you might even say it's a way of being hey <laughs> and in this chapter you you read the first sentence of the chapter and part of it's like feels hopeful but also part of it feels daunting so i'm just gonna read it to you it says the artist's job is never truly finished <sighs> mm-hmm. no but i'm so tired <laughs> oh i just want to take a nap <laughs> What do you mean it's never finished? (laughs) So it's never. (laughs) So (laughs) in many occupations, you go home, you leave your work behind, it's at the office. But an artist is always on call. This is a quote. 
Even after we get up from hours engaged in our craft, the clock is still running. And that's because the artist's job is of two kinds. The work of doing and the work of being. Creativity is something you are, not only something you do. It's a way of moving through the world every minute, every day. If you're not driven to an unrealistic standard of dedication, it might not be the path for you. See, again, we get back into, I like this, I don't like this, I like this, I don't like this. I like, mm-hmm. I just... Right. So he goes on and he talks about how a lot of the artist's work is about balancing this and how you are a creative person who is like absorbing creativity just by existing in the world whether you're trying to or not but also you're a creative person who's trying to make things and that is the artwork and you're going to think about it all the time and I used I used to feel very guilty about not taking my rest very seriously which is just like a whole Mm. American problem in that sentence in itself like (laughs) holy cow (laughs) I (laughs) so like it's to to stay in the creativity and not like burn out your creativity, you have to remain open to the fact that creativity is going to come to you, whether you're making your coffee in the morning or you're driving home from your commute from your day job, or you're doing the actual act of making art, um, whether that's music or drawing or whatever. And it's it's not going to stop. And just knowing that can be a relief, or it can be kind of a torture. <laughs> and depends on where you are in your yeah. in your in your path it's it's interesting i don't know i kind of liked it yeah i mean i don't know about you but i've always i've always felt that you know i'm always like interpreting everything around me like i'm constantly taking in information yeah um I think my YouTube will speak to that. I have the most random stuff on my YouTube. I go down rabbit holes. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like it, it's hard to shut off. Like it's hard to not, again, you know, we're so sensitive to the things around us. It makes it hard day to day. You know, I don't think people understand how intensely some of us experience the world around us. Um, and, and you got to nurture that sensitivity in a way yeah, if you if yeah. you want to be an artist. And I also think sometimes it cannot be turned off for certain people. And if you're one of those, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like you can try yeah. to turn it off. Yeah, but that's yeah, even yeah. more exhausting. And it's like, OK, so acknowledging that is is very important for keeping a, a mind that's sure. able to make art. Uh, yeah, I have I have one more section that I liked about okay. this book. Um, and it, it goes back to how we were talking about play and playfulness in art. And mm. earlier we were, or I was saying that, like, when I think of doing a puzzle, I'm thinking of just having fun and just putting the puzzle together and using my logical brain here and, you know, finding the, f- it's very satisfying to do. And when I'm thinking about making art, it's some of that, but it's also like, okay, I'm finishing a commission that has a dead, like, deadline in a week, or I have a g- mm-hmm. big show coming up and I have to pace things and play happens, but only for a minute. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> there's this, this like mantra that I actually think I'm going to be using moving forward in my life where it's, it says, take art seriously without going about it in a serious way. So, take art seriously without going about it in a serious way. I I want to be able to approach my painting in a way that is joyful. I I want I want it to be the, the thing I love always. It's the thing I love now. I must continue to let myself have that love for decades down the road. <laughs> That's what I want in life. And mm-hmm. I it's my business and I take it seriously because I feel like it has importance. It has importance to me. I feel like it has importance to the people I show it to, etc. And but I don't want to be so bogged down that I'm thinking about it in a cynical way. I don't want to be thinking about it in a way that it must have money attached to it in a way where it's like <laughs> if I'm not doing it, quote unquote, well, that I'm the worst, like, you know, like so I'm, I'm trying to uh, approaching right. the work in a way that is playful and fun and has some light to it that I like. And that I think I can carry on even if I don't like, you know, 70% of this book. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's I think it's easy to forget that play, yeah. you know. Um, for me, like when I get ready to paint, it's a process of setting up. I don't have a studio set up like you do where I can leave things out and I can just like walk in and pick up where I was and not yeah. have to set things up. I have to set things up, tear it back down. It's, it's, it's a work. whole deal. It's a good 35 or 40 minutes just to get ready to do a painting. So I have to be it's a lot of friction. really wanting to paint to do it. So it's, it's a huge hurdle for me. Um, and if I stream, it's even worse. Like it's, <laughs> it's a nightmare at this point to stream, which is why I haven't been streaming and I probably won't until I get a new computer if I do stream again. Um, but yeah, just like it, it's tough to, to look past all that. Like for me, it's the financial, the massive financial burden I have right now on myself that you know, I have to kind of put out of mind so that I can approach my work with the proper perspective mm -hmm. in order to, to do my best. Yeah. Um, and that's hard. That's real hard. Cause I mean, they call it Maslow's hierarchy of needs for a reason, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, uh, if one of those is missing, things get real squiffy real fast. Can so, you have play um, even when the setup for being able to play right. is 35 minutes, which I think is very common. And I mm -hmm. had had that studio for many years before I got the one you see behind me in the YouTube video here. Um, and yeah. it it takes, like, clearly Nomad wants this, right? Like, you are someone who's just like, yeah. no, I really, really want to paint. And, and so yeah. you will go through all those steps and then the play can happen. But yeah. 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 Can you can you have the wonder back into your creative process? And <laughs> can you get that in a way that's not just like, I'm going to put wonder back into my creative process, which I feel like a lot of this book is like, but um. <laughs> <laughs> like, just like, try to pull a fast one on yourself. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> oh. Yeah. No, I hear that. I hear that. I because sometimes it feels irresponsible, you mm -hmm. know, it does like for oh my gosh, good or bad, it feels irresponsible, you know, mm hmm, mm hmm, especially if there's other priorities and you're like, oh, I could yeah. be doing something that's actually going to help me in my future, near or far, <laughs> or I could paint. <laughs> well, and when you have all of like not all of the externals, but a lot of the externals around you telling you you're not being responsible and Ugh. they don't understand where you're coming from. That's hard to drown that voice out. It's real hard and it's hard to get them to understand. And I don't know that they ever will, you know, um, that's just one of the, the burdens we have to carry as an artist. Um, getting other people that, to understand you know, the creative spirit right. that is yeah, who you are as a person is, that's like a whole nother I, I need another book just on that <laughs> like, right like, how to get people to accept exactly. me as an artist oh gosh <laughs> good luck with that one <laughs> if you can write that book i'll, I'll, I'll gladly buy a couple copies <laughs> wow how yeah. to care for your artist <laughs> i know right <laughs> step one. <laughs> oh. um what well, are you, I have a, I, I just have a couple more things I want to talk about with this book before I guess we wrap it up, but mm -hmm. what are your like yeah. opinions? I I just kind of skipped ahead to the second half of the book. So we have to go back to the first half. Um, no, that's fair. Tell me your opinions about the source. Do you know what I mean? Oh, uh, well, I mean, for me personally, I don't, I don't feel the same way he does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that I'm not just as passionate about what drives me to do what I do and where I, I get my inspiration and my motivation from, um, isn't, you know, just as 
powerful and palpable as what he uses to drive himself. Yeah. Um, that's a good way of putting it. And I, yeah, I think that's that's something for me that I have a hard time getting across to people as well. Yeah. You know. This book has many, many chapters. The f- first basically half of the book um, is about if you're feeling a lack of creativity, returning to the source as your source of inspiration and the source being the what gives you creativity and what gives other people creativity and creativity is like this fluid ocean we're in. That's kind of like how I was thinking about it. Um, Mm -hmm. And like ideas pass from one creative to another because it's the idea's time. And that Mm -hmm. if you are feeling like you can't make anything, you're probably not attuned to the source anymore. And that's something you need to really work on. Mm -hmm. And as someone Mm -hmm. who's not religious, this is like, (laughs) I'm like, but what does that even mean? <laughs> like, how do you even, right. <laughs> like, how do you even do that? <laughs> and I never found any sort of thing here that was more useful outside of just like, well, if you meditate and just sit with yourself, you'll find it. Mm. And I'm like, mm. right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, and I think that like, you know, taking walks, hiking, being out in nature. We love those. You know going on adventures you know i think that's just as much of a source and tapping into that source as anything else Mm -hmm. you know um it's it's taking yourself out of your ordinary routine and allowing your brain to kind of stretch a little bit and and breathe think yeah so if you had just said that i would have been like yeah and (laughs) there is a chapter on nature and like going outside yeah touching grass but like it was like two pages. <laughs> Just touch some grass, gosh. <laughs> Take your oh earth sign God, out to a field and set them down. <laughs> <laughs> Take your shoes off, run your feet through the grass, you'll be good. <laughs> yeah, I found oh. out I had a harder time disassociating from the religion of this book or Mm. like just like the tendencies of this book than I have with every other book that we've read that has had these same patterns and Mm -hmm. um like a lot harder I I don't really know why I'm surprised that you didn't have the same issue with the artist way I had similar but not to this extent like the artist way was like a two out of ten there but this book is like a ten out of ten in that feeling (laughs) like it couldn't be escaped it couldn't be replaced by something and like (laughs) It was so, yeah. So, and I think, yeah. see, and for me, it's flip flopped. Like That's funny. I felt Artist Way was ten out of ten, and this was like a two out of ten. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's inter- It's so interesting what triggers each person. Like, yeah, it's life experience. You know, it's it brings up something somehow in each one of us. You know, um, I do yeah. think this book will be perfect for some people, and I. Do you think, like, I'm not going to say that this is a bad book. Um, I, right. I I do feel like it does have a, a place for some creatives and that just, it wasn't it for me. Um, and that's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to, I'm going to probably give this book to someone who I know who would love this, who right. wants this right. more almost mystical way of thinking about creativity than what I feel is mm. what I need. Yeah. 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 Sure. Um. Any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, uh, there was one section that he talked about competition. Ooh, yeah. Let's talk and, about and, um, like collaborating. And I think, you know, I don't know how it's been for you, but I think my observation of the artist world in general is that it feels very competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, we're competing for a customer and that's not, I don't think that's the case. Like, I think we need to look at it more like he looks at it. You know, he talks about, you know, people working like they were famous artists that worked as a workshop. Like the artist would give the, you know, the general idea or a sketch and then they would pass it off to somebody else to finish. Yeah. Yeah we wouldn't call that any less 
of a work by them than anything else. Um, and so, you know, it made me think of the book that we read before where um, they talk about Takahashi Murakami mm-hmm. and and his setup. Uh, Takahashi has three different studios that are massive. He has his main studio in Japan. He has another one, I think, in London. And then he has one in the United States in New York City. And all of this is Takahashi. All of it's Takahashi. Like when you sit and talk with him and you see the work, you're like, oh, yeah, this is definitely Takahashi. Right. It's not anybody else. Um, And so, yeah, like to see that, that like, yeah, we can't collaborate. And like he talks about how, um, you know, collaboration isn't like trying to put your two cents in it's trying to build up an idea together be it you know like he says you know sometimes it can be tyrannical in some respects or like a dictatorship where it's like you have a band leader and they have a focus and they you know they set the agenda and everybody else uplifts underneath that like their instrument works to uh, you know meet that um that agenda Mm -hmm. and so like working together as opposed to like trying to jockey for some position or something you know and all of that um yeah it's i don't know yeah like he says oh why would we want to create um with the purpose of diminishing somebody else Which I think is something that we really, really need to keep in mind as artists because there's so much noise out there that tells us that we need to compete each other. Yeah. Compete with each other. I don't feel like I need to compete with each other with another person when I'm actively making the painting, but I do feel that Mm -hmm. when I'm marketing my work and trying to get a sale. Right. And that's... Right. That's... It's it's just... It happens sometimes. Although it's it's interesting. I, I don't often feel like I'm directly competing with other geometric abstract painters um, for some reason. Like I, <laughs> I, I feel like <laughs> I compete more with, I don't even know how to like, I, I the, the idea is vague in my brain. And so like, I'm sure some people do make art thinking, okay, I'm competing. Like, okay. Like, so say you're like making pet portraits on etsy you have a direct competition left right and center all over the damn internet right but right when i'm feeling most competitive it's usually when i'm in like a group show and other people's paintings are selling or um (laughs) and mine's not (laughs) or i am like trying to it's almost always around selling the work but when i'm just making art I, Mm -hmm. i i feel like my competition is way like the the feeling of like oh i'm losing the competition is mm-hmm. like really non-existent when i'm just just painting right. i don't know yeah i think you know for me it's like when i'm standing in front of the easel i'm fine mm-hmm. you know that doesn't enter my mind i'm focused um, i'm enjoying what i'm doing and um and it's okay but then it's those in between times you know when like that night like when i'm just surfing the internet or checking out instagram and i see things and then all of a sudden like this competitiveness pops up in me yeah and i'm like why you know i I think that's one thing that this book kind of gave me a perspective on was like just be you like as cheesy and cliche as that is the best thing you can do is paint for yourself that is going to be the most honest thing that you can do don't have an agenda like he talks about political art and everything in that and there's a place for that and everything but i get where he's coming from like if that's what you're doing are you doing a disservice to being a creative like you're you're bending it to your will instead of allowing it to kind of come through you um i I feel the people yeah like the people who make truly great political art 
are ones who feel the political message so intensely that that is their focus and they're not trying to make a message they're just feeling that and that feels very honest and i think that's interesting and sure i i think it's a very good sign that when you go to the easel you're not feeling competitive that the competition lays on your cell phone (laughs) <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's on the yeah, internet yeah, yeah. yeah and if you if you can stay there you're not going to be in the slippery slope of this actually affecting your painting but it does it does it is something for you to think about and you, you as a general sure. you not you as just as in jen here um <laughs> and it's it's um yeah. yeah it's it's interesting we get into pickles sure yeah it gets interesting yep, yep, yep. well uh how would you uh Read this. Read this book. Mm, out of five. Out of five. Um, I'd give it a three out of five. Mm-hmm. I'm giving it a two. <laughs> You're like it's a two I'd out give of five. It a one. It's not a one. <laughs> I've read ones. It's not a one. It's a two. <laughs> which I feel like I give <laughs> two. two star ratings the most infrequently, which means I have a lot of opinions. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um. Yeah. That's Aww. that's the creative act, a way of being. Yeah, um, you can sure. find this book literally everywhere. It's, you can find it in so many places. If you are interested in this book and you need a creative pick me up, this might be the book for you. And I'm not. I'm gonna say give it a try. You can find it at the library. You can find it at the airport. You can find it at my house on my shelf getting dusty. Um, <laughs> 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 it's so good. Um, yeah. You can find the uh, podcast on uh, my website, stephaniescott.art. It's also on YouTube. If you're watching this version on YouTube, hi, it's good to see you. Um, (laughs) Jennifer and I record Art Book Club on Twitch on second Sundays every month. And you should come to the next live show like our fellow chatters here and (laughs) chat with us about the next book. I think it's going to be really good. Um, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to hear the next book? Do you want to do you want to see it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, I'm going to turn <laughs> off all my pictures of Rick. I say, no, no. <laughs> Goodbye. We're all done with you. All right, so this next book is a it's a philosophy book. We haven't read a philosophy book yet for Art Book Club. This book is called The Entanglement by Alva Noe. He is a philosopher. Not The Entanglement. By Jada Pinkett Smith, to no, be correct. This is Alva Noe. <laughs> we're not we're not talking about scandalous relationships. Instead, we're talking about how <laughs> art and philosophy makes us the way we are. Um, Alva Noe is a philosopher who has written about art and philosophy in many many iterations. You can find videos of him talking about it on YouTube. You can find so many podcasts he's been on. Things like this. He's very contemporary. This book just came out, um, like late last year. And I, uh, I think, I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a little bit dry. So just heads up, if you've never read a straight up philosophy book before, it can be something that's tough to get through. And I just need you to know that (laughs) because the first time I read a philosophy book, I was like, why do people like this? (laughs) So Mm -hmm. just prepare yourself for that. (laughs) Um, but I also think he's going to have interesting points about art. This is my second um, my second book that I'll have read from this author and he's mm. he's got some interesting points about art and what art is and this one's going to go into a little bit into AI it's going to go into how mm. art and life can't be in, like separated and what makes art what it is and how it can help us un- understand human nature I think it's going to be interesting so this yeah. is the entanglement yeah and it's it's gonna be fun and uh yeah we'll be meeting next on april something or another um april 14th (laughs) at 3 p.m pacific time here on twitch Um, the day before tax day the day before tax day do your taxes early lovely so you can correct things (laughs) it's good um (laughs) and uh yeah that's it you can find me and my art my personal art at stephanie scott to art over on instagram and Jennifer, where can people find you? You can find me here uh, under Visual Nomad. 
And you can check me out on my website at visualnomad.art. Yeah. And that's that. Thanks for listening to Art Book Club on Freshwork Podcast, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Make it choices. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Can goodbye, I leave? Goodbye. Can I leave us with a quote? Oh, yeah. Give me a quote. <laughs> no. Okay. Quote to leave you guys with. <laughs> Sometimes the mistakes are what makes a work great. Humanity breathes in mistakes. I like it. That's good. Okay, peace out, Girl Scouts. Bye. <laughs>